So we're, we're developing some interesting themes here. Um, and I, I think Ted kind of pulled it together, that, and, and John too, that there's, we, we don't, as, as we look at our careers, say, well, I'm going to spend 10 years doing law or investment banking or something, and at the end of it, when I've got some money and some time, I'm going to give back. Uh, you can advance yourself and advance the country simultaneously. And Sylvia, let me ask you, do you see a lot of organizations, you see a lot of change going on like TED. Um, what do you think are some, what is some advice you can give the young folks here who are, have their whole lives ahead of them, they've got some ideas for some things they'd like to do. Um, over the next five years, where are the opportunities to, to both give back and also create the networks that will, that will advance them personally? Um, I would start, first I want to just say I'm just so glad to be a part of this and these students that already are engaged and that's great to see. And when we talked about mentoring and inspiration, one of the inspirations I find is when you see the kind of engagement that is happening today that we see with these students in the competition. To me, that's part of what inspires me to continue in this, this space and work. The three things, I would think about what is your passion? Uh, what do you think you have to contribute and where do you think you'll grow? And then put that in the context. I believe that the type of thing we're talking about, when you think about those things in your career trajectory and what you're going to do, when you think about those things, whether it's in the context of business, in the context of government, or in the context of philanthropy or community-based organizations. And when you think about what are you going to do, you find things that will make uh, maximize on those three things. And I believe in each of those spaces today, you can give back in incredible ways. And most organizations, as Ted was reflecting, the idea of uh, business-enabled philanthropy or the idea that this is a fundamental part of what a business is. So I believe that you can pursue this in if you choose a uh, career in the private sector. And even historically, could. when I was at McKinsey, I tutored. I was at McKinsey, New York, working on financial services companies. But the company sponsored a program to tutor children at the Boys Choir of Harlem. Uh, and so I think that you can put together the picture that allows you to live your passions uh, in many, many different ways. Companies are able to do that. We, you know, public service and government, and whether it's government at the national level, as John and I have both served in, or at the local and state level, very important things are going on there. And students like the students that are already doing great work will be great leaders uh, in those community and local levels. Those are opportunities too. And then in the space of philanthropy and organizations, whether it's philanthropy like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or organizations like an organization called TechnoServe, which takes a business-based approach to helping farmers around the world in the developing world, such as with cashews and cashew production, and helping those farmers get to that next level of production. So I think the options really are endless, and it is about each student and each individual thinking about that, what am I passionate about, what am I good at, what am I going to learn at, and what am I going to have fun at? and apply it as they look in those different areas. I, I'm going to give you another reason to do it. Um, <laughs> so I, I just thought of this. Um, a young man approached a bunch of us and, and had this idea to start a business. It was called The Point. And The Point was um, this business that um, would build databases of neighborhoods of passionate local people who wanted to vote and think the right way, and, and it would surface an issue. Um, PEPCO wants to build power lines in your community. Here's all the objective information on why that's a good thing. And then here's all the objective information on why it's a bad thing. And then you would vote online, you'd be educated, you'd vote online, and then this company, The Point, would bring, here's what the community is thinking, the, the public Vox Populi, to Pepco. So Pepco would know what the community was thinking. And we invested in it, and it was a total and complete failure. I mean, it just, it was the worst business ever. And he ran out of money. 
quit. He said, I, I'm sorry I took your money. It doesn't work. I'm going to give you your money back. But I have one idea that I think this communal sharing and activation could work. And that became Groupon. It's <laughs> a true story. And Peter Barris and I are the investors in Groupon. I'm vice chairman of Groupon. It's a $5 billion top line business. It's not four years old. And, and Andrew Mason, who was the founder of the company, is a great kid. He just launched Grassroots Groupon, takes that platform, the 180 million people that are in the database, and said, okay, now I've built this huge business, and I, I can launch a little bit of like what the point was to support charities using that platform. And so Andrew has done very well for himself at a young age, and um, his social consciousness uh, ended up, sometimes the first right answer isn't the best right answer, and built a, a really important, powerful company in the e-commerce space. But that, that's how that company started. Fabulous, <laughs> fabulous. Um, John, you have uh, a, a chance to talk to a lot of young people, uh, see a lot of young people. What advice um, from your own life and from what you're seeing out there would you give to to these folks here and the you know, folks watching online about about um, how they can match their skills and ambitions to to something larger. Well, of course, the group in the auditorium um, has already taken one of our pieces of advice to heart, um, which is to get started early on giving back because that will create opportunities for you. One counsel I would have is. Uh, there's a, there's a tendency to think sometimes, um, again, when you're focused on, on your, your sort of main vocational undertaking, that you can't fit in the time for these other things. But there's always time. And the people that do this best are the busiest people. I mean, that's an old adage. But I remember when I was a young associate in my law firm, <coughs> um, the people in the firm, the chairman of the firm at that time was Ben Civiletti, who was, had been Attorney General of the United States, and others were, they were citizen lawyers. And so just by their example, you understood that you couldn't really uh, be all that you could be in that, and this was a corporate law firm, but that if you weren't finding a way to connect to the community and serve the community, um, you just weren't, you weren't hitting the high bar. And the lesson for me in that was get started as early as you can. Figure out a way to reserve space in your life to give back and, and do for others. Um, because the danger can be that for those people who say, well, I'll wait and do it later, is, is sort of psychologically they never create that space. And they never end up actually doing it a lot of the time. So you have to condition yourself to understand that you have the capacity to do both things. And then as you advance your ability to be successful and contribute um, in both of those arenas will also progress and develop. The other thing I would say is don't, um, don't get ahead of yourself, right? I mean, the, the wonderful thing about giving back is it will lead you to the next thing. And so, you know, being in an audience like this, listening to sort of these amazing things that, that Ted has done, and Sylvia, and so forth, um, you know, the imagination runs wild. It's just sort of, what's next for me? But, you know, focus and think small in a sense in terms of how you give back. Look around in your own um, universe, the universe that you actually do have some control over, some impact on. I mean, I live in a, I, I, I work in a place where people, a lot of the time, are always thinking about the next thing they're going to do instead of doing the thing that they actually have control and influence over. And I think that, you know, that's sort of a human tendency, but when it comes to giving back, you can find right there, right in front of you, an opportunity to do it. And if you make that commitment, 
it will lead you very naturally to the next step that you should take. And so in that sense, I guess what I'm saying is, is pace yourself in terms of how you do this, and you'll find your way. I mean, these stories that Ted is telling are, are wonderful examples of that. I mean, people have an idea, they have a commitment, they want to do something. They try, maybe it doesn't work out this way, but it finds some other way to manifest itself going forward for the good of that individual and for the good of the community that they serve. Yeah, and I think the other, the other uh, point of Ted's great Groupon example is that the, the fellow who failed made connections uh, and got advice from people that helped him on his next thing. And so the networks that you build, even in failure, can, can lead to success. Um, Bill, do we have a microphone where we can maybe, in the last minutes, get a few questions from the audience? I know you all may have some questions for Ted or Sylvia or, or John, so don't be shy. If somebody's got a question, just raise your hand and Bill will bring you the microphone. Thank you all very, very much for being here. This has been an excellent morning. Uh, my name is Ted Theodoro. I'm a sixth grade social studies teacher in Fairfax County. and. One of the things you know I feel very blessed and fortunate for is that I, you know, even in my young 28 years, I get to mentor students, you know, in the classroom and outside the classroom too, as a coach uh, in the county. But I wonder, I'm very worried, and I could talk about education policy all day. But one of the things that I'm, this is one of the things I'm very interested in. I used to think that, you know, believe in that adage, you have to have money to make money. But you guys have all proved to me today that. That's maybe not the case. You just need a little creativity and some passion, and then that goes a long way. But I'm just wondering, what would you like to see in terms of um, our schools here in America to help foster that kind of creativity and that passion? Um, I see a lot of students today that are just beat down with standardized tests, and that that creativity and that passion just seems to beat out, be beat out of them. So, what kind of what kind of things would you like to see for our schools, and things that I can do as a teacher to encourage that? Uh. Gentlemen, uh, Sylvia? I'll let you all go. John, did you want to? Well, I was just going to say, um, one of the things we can do for our schools, and as I understand from some of the proposals that were brought forward today, is to gather together partners to work with our schools. Because um, the schools, and I had the opportunity for eight years to work for the State Department of Education. Uh, on reform of the Baltimore City school system, which is a you know, struggling urban school system. And I saw the challenges that you're very familiar with uh, in terms of you know, students sometimes being in an environment where they, they really can't see uh, what's next. The way to break through that, obviously you need, you need quality teachers in your classroom, you need administrators who are instructional leaders and so forth and the organizations that uh, have the authority over these schools need to commit to that but at the same time uh, those schools that have been most successful I think are ones that also build partnerships and bridges to the outside community and so some of the teams in this room I know have made proposals of that kind others who are listening or watching online may have the opportunity to give back to their schools, and you become instantaneous role models. I mean, this is the thing. Um, when you interact with, with young people um, in, in their formative years, and you show them first what you're doing, uh, but also that you care about them and you value their contribution, that may be the spark for them that they're not getting another way. So. Um, I think your question dovetails uh, very well with what the purpose of this, this gathering is, which is giving back. One of, the, one of the best ways to give back is to connect to young people and to do it uh, in schools. And the strength, the power, the vision, the success of any community, any organization, um, any country, I think, is best exhibited in the commitments and investments it makes in the next generation. And I commend Leon and Bill and this organization for understanding that. But you're doing that too by, by what you're doing in your school. Um, starting a business on campus. My first business I ever started was 
on the campus of Georgetown University. 1976, uh, Snoco Loco Inc., where I sold red, white, and blue snow cones. <laughs> I employed nine other students. And uh, I introduced variable pricing, one of the first examples. It was 80 to 90 degrees, it was 50 cents a snow cone, 90 to 100 degrees, so it was a dollar. Over 100, 100 degrees, two dollars a snow cone. And um, so, so being an entrepreneur, starting a small business, employing people, uh, really, really important. Uh, in terms of teaching, I mean, we all could go on. We could have a weekend at Georgetown to talk about how broken our educational system is and how um, ill-equipped and not well-served we are making so many students. There's the, the biggest issue right now in, in our election, what everyone is talking about is economy and, and jobs. I mean, that's, uh, that's what we'll come down to. There's three million jobs right now that are open, that are unfilled, because we don't have enough students that know technology, know math, know engineering. And, and so, so I, I do think that they will be over the next 10 years, technology, entrepreneurs, private sector are working really, really hard to try to add value to help fix that problem both because it's the right thing to do, but because we need better prepared employees to help us be more competitive against India and China and, and the rest of the world that's gunning for what we have for so long in our economy. Sylvia, were you gonna? I would just add, yeah, thank you for what you do every day. And in terms of that change in education, I think the teacher is a fundamental and important part, while well, there are other parts, and I would just say three things, and that's one, uh, relevance, quality, and inspiration. Making sure that the students understand the relevance in the classroom, the quality of that teaching to give them the tools they need, and then the inspiration. We've been talking about the mentoring, and John spoke to this point, that the importance of that teacher in inspiring and helping students who might not understand, you can go somewhere, you can do something, and I'm sure that's what you do every day, but you doing it and your peers doing it more and more, I think, is an important part. There are a number of other things, as John mentioned, that have to occur, but I just think you are at the center of the change that can occur for our nation in our schools. Great. Bill, do we have some time for another question? Yeah. One or two. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Milos Popovich. Uh, I'm a freshman at Georgetown. And I want to thank you all for your words of wisdom. And uh, I wanted to ask you something. Regarding uh, local communities, do you feel like the power of a voice, just a voice, is undervalued in the sense that people who have a voice do not see any possibility of sharing that voice with the silenced in their local communities. For example, um, I came from a community in Princeton, New Jersey in the school system where um, students in the special education department um, did not really have a voice outside of their, their one class, their one classroom where they spent all their day. Um, what things do you think you can, be, can be done to transcend the idea of a voice it, that it's not just an internal thing, that it can be transferred on uh, to those silence in local communities, especially among uh, disabled children uh, in uh, public schools. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I would point to the business Ted as been a visionary in, in the sense that we now have new technologies, new platforms, new ways of, of people whose voices were hidden. Uh, being able to be sort of fully expressed and to join with other voices that, that may have been hidden. Now the challenge in this, and, and I'm talking about social networking tools and so forth, the challenge is you've got um, you've got to make sure that you don't have what some refer to as the digital divide or what have you, that, that some have access to these technologies and others uh, do not. But if we focus on making sure that there's equal opportunity to access these new technologies for reaching out beyond yourself um, to build communities uh, online and then to kind of reconnect people from the online experience to the to the offline experience as I heard someone the other day refer to it 
um, which is getting back into the real world, perhaps. Um, I think that if we, if we commit ourselves to making sure those opportunities are equally distributed, then you can break through the kind of silence you described in any, in any arena, um, and people can start making those very, very powerful connections, which then in turn can lead to the kind of change that we want to see. And if you all want to uh, answer that question, that's great. But if we can, if not, we can get one or two more questions before the time is done. Uh, Just two more. A judge. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dean Phillips, uh, local here in DC, and I've had the opportunity to actually give back to my, my company and my activities. And I want, I wonder if you guys would address something that we found that I found is the importance of friends including each other in bringing someone into a volunteer activity. Opposed to doing it yourself, but including those right around you, and how that makes it or can make it successful. Well, um, this is not a direct answer to your question, but I spent a lot of time, as John has, looking at the AmeriCorps program. And AmeriCorps tried a lot of different things, putting young people in a lot of different places. And some of it worked out, but what AmeriCorps found uh, as the sweet spot, the thing where they could, the program could really add value, was not doing the volunteering themselves, but orchestrating the volunteers. So an AmeriCorps member who, as you may know, AmeriCorps has about 50, 60,000 young people, mostly young people, with a small siphon out in uh, partnering with uh, community organizations like Big Brother, Big Sister, and Habitat for Humanity, and instead of swinging the hammers in the, at the place where the home is being built, they're there before everyone gets there, making sure the hammers are there, and, and the tools are there, and the water bottles are there, and people, the transportation is there, and people get called who are supposed to volunteer that day and reminded to get there, and uh, make sure the lunch gets there, and leverage their ability, use that, use that ability to leverage the work of others. So, I think in, in any kind of community uh, uh, endeavor, community service endeavor, the capacity to be the one to, to make the connections and do the organizing and, and allow for, uh, engage and empower people to use some of their time to volunteer is, is absolutely crucial. I think that's a wonderful question because you can get hyper-focused on the idea of you, the individual, giving back, but part of giving back is reaching out to others and asking them to do the same, uh, to do the same thing. And as, you know, as, a, as someone who's in politics, I know research shows, for example, that um, the most persuasive thing that you can do um, as a candidate to get somebody to support you is to convince a voter to make the case to their friends and their coworkers. The, the most powerful testimonial that comes in support of a candidate is the one that's made by one person to their friends and their colleagues. Because that's a relationship that's, that's highly developed based on trust, and that's what makes the difference. So in the same vein, if you're pursuing a particular um, effort to give back, you ought to be reaching out to those around you. And, at least letting them know what the opportunity is. And on that point, let me just say, I mean, to kind of bring it back to this, to the Hellenism component of this, because we are focusing on Greeks giving back largely here. Um, I think that this, this, this willingness to give back is something that we should be connecting to our, our Greek heritage. That we should understand that Hellenism calls upon us to do this. And it doesn't mean that other groups and other traditions and other ethnicities and so forth out there don't have similar commitments. But I think we can identify in Hellenism this commitment to giving back. I mentioned the word philotimo before, which I interpret as calling upon you to serve your community. Um, but in that sense, Greek Americans should be reaching out to other Greek Americans and making the case <coughs> that your heritage calls upon you to do this. And you can find in your heritage everything you need to understand why this 
is important. And I've, I've sort of coined this phrase, Hellenism in the public service, which is the idea that you give back as a philanthropist, um, as someone who chooses to serve on the board of a hospital, as an AmeriCorps volunteer, but that your Greek heritage, in effect, and your Hellenism calls upon you to do this. And I, I would love to see a time when you go to any city in America, and if you asked a non-Greek, um, what do you think of when you think of the Greek community? That in addition to saying, well, I always go to the Greek festival in St. Anthony's <laughs> Church, or my favorite Greek restaurant is, you know, Aphrodite uh, down on Main Street, they also say, I've noticed that that's a community that gives back. I've noticed that they, they are on the board of the local museum and the local hospital, that they volunteer, that they raise money, um, you know, for, for uh, diabetes awareness in the community or whatever it is. We have the power in our community uh, to have that kind of a profile in the larger community. And the efforts today of these teams, I think, speaks to that uh, very power. Um, thoughts, Sylvia? Uh, if we want to take another question, I'm, I'm happy to hold and Great. take one more question. Here. One more? One more. We can, we can squeeze in one more. Hello. Hi, my name is George Koliopoulos. Um, uh, while I like to think that a lot of people, they just search for charities to donate out of the goodness of their hearts. Like everything, every business, you have to, you have to sell something. You know, you, you, I mean, you have to not sell it, but pitch it in a way to attract people. Like what value is there, what is the best way to pitch your cause out to certain demographics to get to pull them in because like anything you have to run it like a successful business and every successful business is noticed and is popular um what is the best way to do that um well i, I think you that was a very mature internalization of what the issue is that um, you can't say yes to everyone who's pitching you on something whether it's a business or it's a charity and most charitable endeavors are of good heart and good intention, but they fail because they're not looked at with the vigor as, as a business. And businesses, Gates Foundation, Walmart Foundation, just they're looking for outcomes and managed outcomes and sustainability with the real math around it. And so you do have to be very, very focused on what the numbers are and what the outcomes are expected and what the business model around your charity is. And you know, being a social entrepreneur is no different than being a founder of a company. And you have to write a business plan. I'd also say not losing sight of a higher calling of what you want to do. I think that the best organizations, the best enterprises, do all of the little things really well and never lose sight of the grinding it out nature of the day-to-day -day tactical execution. But they also have a romance about them. They also have a big picture. Um, you know, I. It's great to go for a couple hours and talk and never have to talk about my hockey team or basketball <laughs> team. But, 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 you know, yes, I want to sell tickets. Yes, we want to win games. Yes, we want to win the playoffs. You know, of course we want to win a Stanley Cup. But I want to bring our community closer together. I want, I want to make lifetime memories between fathers and sons and mothers and daughters who you know, were there to witness a championship and have that with them forever, right? At AOL, um, we, we never wanted to be a $100 billion valued company or the biggest media company in the world. We articulated we wanted to build a 
medium that was more valuable than the telephone and the television and bring democracy around the world and empower individuals to be educated. We had this big romantic theme and then we became a hundred billion dollar <laughs> enterprise. When we lost our way, when we acquired Time Warner and the merged company, we said, well, what is our, what is our big idea? What is our, what is our higher calling? It was generate $11 billion of EBITDA. And that's not a higher calling. That's kind of an outcome to something else. And so the most gifted enterprise of the most gifted companies, they find the way to have that big idea, that romantic notion, that big sustainable driver. And then they know what the outcomes they're managing to. They put metrics around it and they grind it out every day trying to improve and, and be better you know, in the process of what they've created on a daily basis. Well, um, I want to thank Chad and John and Sylvia for taking a big chunk of their Saturday to come talk to us all. And I uh, want you to give them a round of applause. But I yourselves a round of applause. This is a phenomenal achievement you all We're all inspired by you and I hope you've gotten some inspiration today to take back. Thank you.